This is part two of our kitchen table build. We'll be showing the rest of the process and the completed table in this video. Our total cost for this table is under $150 and we're using all reclaimed lumber in the build. When we left off last time, I was drilling the holes in the metal straps that I'll be using to attach the diagonal braces. Got these. The diagonal braces themselves will be made of the same three and a quarter by three and a quarter oak pieces that I used for the rest of the base. And so I need to attach those metal braces to them. So I'm clamping them on and transferring the holes. This table will be a custom fit to our kitchen design. It's going to be tall, a counter height table, and it'll be long and narrow, eight feet by 32 inches wide. The tabletop is solid live oak, an inch and a half thick, extremely heavy, and so I want this base to be very heavy duty, very sturdy. That's why I'm installing these diagonal braces. Here I'm cutting bevels on the end of the diagonal braces. They're already cut to length, and I think these bevels will add a nice look. Here is a drawing that I made of the project when I was conceptualizing it. I wanted to add some metal to the wood structure, and so I'm using metal pieces to attach the diagonal braces to the base. I'm having to fabricate all of my own brackets, of course, and there are a couple of pieces that are definitely unusual that I'm going to have to weld up. I dug through the shop and found some old scrap metal that'll work perfectly for this. I'm going to be using a piece of pipe combined with a piece of rectangular channel and some other little pieces of scrap metal to make that bottom connection. Here I am welding them together. I'm not the best welder, but I can definitely stick it together. I'm going to be grinding it all down before I finish it anyway. With everything fabbed, I'm ready to submerse everything in a couple baths of vinegar. This will remove the scale from the strap metal that I used and the piece that I fabricated, and it'll remove the nickel from the bolts, washers, and nuts. This will need to soak for about 24 hours, maybe 36, but it should completely remove everything, and by the time I'm done, I'll have a nice uniform color and look on all the metal pieces instead of having shiny bolts and dark scaly metal. I've removed the pieces from the vinegar bath. It's important to immediately rinse them, dry them off, and coat them in oil. They rust incredibly fast if you don't. Here I'm doing a little routing on the pendulum brace. The way these metal straps attached, the ones from one side will overlap the ones from the other side, and I don't want them to stick way out, so I'm recessing the straps that go on one side of the brace and that where those attached to the pendulum. I just trace the location of the brace and then use the router to remove the material to the correct depth and finish up the edges with the chisel. In the last video, we showed how I made the mortise and tenons, and here I am working on the shoulder of one of these. It didn't fit quite right and just needed a little trimming. Next, I'm ready to perform the final sand before finishing on all of the base pieces. We just got a little video, but this took several hours. Now moving back to the top. In our last video, I put in 18 bow ties to stabilize the tabletop, and now those have been drying for a few days and I'm ready to start flattening the table. Here's a few of the tools that I'll be using. A couple different types of planers, power and manual, some winding sticks, sanders, and etc. The tabletop had warped a little bit after glue up due to those cracks in the wood. I've stabilized those now with the bow ties, and I'm ready to use a hand plane to take the warp out of this top. I'm using a slightly rounded blade on my plane, and I'm going across the grain of the wood. This helps me to quickly hog off the material to get it close. And here you can see what that looks like, the, the look that that slightly rounded blade leaves on the wood. It really moves the material quickly. Once I had it close with the hand plane, I was ready to move on to the belt sander. I'm using 80 grit sandpaper here to take off the highs and lows left from that blade that I used on my hand plane. This will allow me to get the entire table pretty close. Once I'm done here, I'll use a smaller sander to move through the finer grits. After the top was pretty well finished up, I was ready to go ahead and remove the extra material off the ends and take the piece to finish length. I made it an additional three or four inches long so that I'd have extra material to cut off at the end. It really makes it easier when you do your glue up and stuff to have some extra material that you know you'll be removing. Here I've clamped on a piece of oak that has a nice straight edge that I'll be using as a guide or a fence so that when I make this cut it'll be nice and straight. 
And here I'm just double checking myself. I want to make sure that it is absolutely square with the rest of the table and my measurements are right because I can't do this twice. And then I'm using my little cordless handsaw here to remove the material. Now I just need to move on to the other side and repeat the process over there. I'm cutting this table to exactly 8 feet long, and it really feels huge. It's a very long table. The next step was to put a chamfer on the edge of the table. I like a nice, simple, elegant design, and so a 45 degree chamfer was the perfect solution. This part was a little stressful for me, just because I'm always worried about the wood splitting out, especially along these long edges. Sometimes you can catch the seam in the wood or a natural crack in the wood, and it'll just chip out a big long chunk. And I was really worried about that happening. Fortunately, that wasn't a concern at all. This wood is very hard, very tough, and gnarly, and stuck together well, didn't want to chip out. The wood species I'm using for this table is all live oak, which is incredibly hard, gnarly, and tough. It's about twice as hard as normal oak, which is already very hard. So it's been interesting. It's very hard on tools. I've dulled two sets of chisels so far on this project and had to resharpen my plane blades many times. I was worried that this router bit wouldn't make it through this edging process. That pretty much finishes up the top of the table. It'll just need to be sanded later, but before I do that, I want to flip the table over and work on the underneath side. It is also a little warped and needs some work. So I just need to get this flatter than it is. I have an 8 foot level that I'll be using as a straight edge on the backside here to make sure that I have any warps or bows out of it. And so I'm laying that up and I'm just looking for gaps underneath. Then I do a little marking so that I can come back later and remove that material on the high spots with a electric planer to begin with. First I look down the length of the table and make some markings as I go for later, then I go across makes those same kind of markings, just looking for little gaps with a straight edge, just making some notes for myself, and I'll be using those as reference points as I'm going over it with the hand plane like here. Of course, I'll have to do this several times. As I plane it off, I lose my marks, and I have to re-measure and you know, take a new look at it with the straight edge, and so I repeat this process several times. This electric hand planer is wonderful for hogging off material, and I use it for that quite a bit. But once I get close, I have to move to the hand plane, which I don't think I got any video of on the back side here, but I use that quite a bit, and then finished up with the belt sander. I also did put a bevel on the back side, a much smaller bevel than on the top. The next step was to fill in the cracks and some of the bigger holes in this wood. This wood has a lot of character, um, lots of cracks that need to be filled. There was some wood boring insects that had left tunnels through part of this wood, and all of that needs to be filled in. Even though this is the underneath of the table, I want to get it filled in so that it further stabilizes the tabletop. Here I'm using some 5-minute epoxy to fill up one of the larger cracks. The epoxy is great for filling in large gaps, but it's fairly thick and doesn't flow real good. It also sets up really fast. So I only used it for the really big cracks, or the really big voids. For the smaller cracks, I used either super glue for the really small ones, or a custom putty that I make myself. The super glue works really great to get into those tight, fine cracks. I have a thick super glue. You can get it in different viscosities. I get the thick kind, and it has just the right viscosity to soak into fine cracks and really seal them up. After everything had dried, I did a rough sanding, and I was ready to flip the table back over to the front side. First thing I wanted to do on the front was to check everything out to make sure it wasn't warped or twisted, and fortunately it looked like it was stable and nothing had moved. So I moved on to filling cracks. I had originally intended to use epoxy and kind of the same combination of stuff on the top that I did on the bottom, but I got a good look at the epoxy that I used on the bottom and didn't like the way it turned out. It had some bubbles in it, it looked kind of semi-transparent and wasn't real appealing, 
and I thought what looked the nicest was the putty, so I decided to use that exclusively on the top. I'm using a mix of wood glue dust that I pulled out of the sander from when I was sanding this tabletop, and some pre-made putty from the store that had a nice coloration. I used that to darken it. This process took way longer than I expected. There are so many cracks when you get to looking. I probably made 15 batches of putty up to fill all these cracks in the table. Back in the shop, I'm putting a layer of plastic over my workbench so that I can move on to the next step. I'll be assembling the base for the final time and applying the finish. This is a really fun part of the process. Everything is built, test fitted, and sanded and ready to go. And so this is, this is really fun. I'm just bolting everything together here I'll be assembling it right on my tabletop where it's easy to get to everything for the finishing process. I'm not gluing any of these joints, I'm just bolting it together with some self-tapping lag bolts that I made. One of the reasons I decided not to glue it is so that in the future if someone wanted to lower this table, it is countertop height so it's pretty high, and in the future if you know one of my prodigy owned this table and wanted to lower it to normal table height, they could just easily take it apart and shorten the legs and it wouldn't be too big of a deal to shorten it. The legs are standalone pieces that are connected by a crossbeam that I'm putting on right now. One thing I might mention is that I did put a little toe piece onto the side of each leg to raise the leg off of the floor by about an inch so that it just rests on those end toe pieces. This cross piece is connected with a couple of dovetail fits that I did. Those worked out really well and are nice and sturdy. And this pendulum is another mortise and tenon fit. And it's finally time to apply the finish. I'm applying a nice wet coat of boiled linseed oil and enjoying the color and figure that it brings out in this wood. We'll be using a little bit different finishes for the top of the table and the base of the table. For the base, I'm just using boiled linseed oil. I'll be doing several applications, at least four and, and perhaps more with a little bit of time for each one of those to dry. It'll leave a nice matte finish that's still beautiful and durable, but for the top of the table, I'll be using a heavy-duty polyurethane finish. The first coat is always the most fun to apply. It's so fun to watch as it's transformed from this dusty, pale color to this rich, vibrant, colorful wood that you see here. This oil that I'm using is some that we had left over from when we did the earthen floors in our home. We bought it in bulk and had some left over, so I'm able to use some of that extra here, and I have it cut with citrus solvent. The citrus solvent allows it to absorb deeper into the wood and dry faster. It also smells ridiculously good. It smells just like fresh squeezed orange juice. I will go over this several times until the wood won't take any more, and then I'll allow it to set for maybe 15 or 30 minutes before I wipe off the excess. Now back to the tabletop. I'm ready to sand down all of that wood filler and begin the final sanding process. I'm expecting this to take a good while, possibly a couple of days. I'm using a coarse 80 grit sandpaper on this belt sander to quickly remove the excess putty from those cracks that I filled. I did have to go back in and touch up or refill some of the cracks that I didn't get enough putty in the first time. Once the coarse sanding was done, I was ready to move on to the finer grits, and for those I move on to a small orbital sander. With the small sander, I started out with the 120 and then worked up to 180 and finally 220. I buy sandpaper in bulk in 50 packs, and it's a good thing I do because I use a ton of it. Probably at least 15 or so of each grit. I use the hand sander to sand the sides and the chamfer as well. It's really starting to look nice now. It's getting very smooth to the touch and almost shiny even without a finish. And that finishes up the sanding on this tabletop. It is finally ready for finish. We're going to flip it over so the backside is facing up and do the finish on the back first. We've been trying to decide what kind of a finish to do on this tabletop. We could either go natural with like an oil finish covered with polyurethane or use the graying compound to accelerate the aging and have a neat grade look. And we couldn't decide which way to go so we did a test piece to see what they both look like. We found that the oil brought out a lot of interesting color variation in the wood and that the graying aging accelerator 
just washed everything out. It turned everything different shades of gray. And so in the end, we decided to go with the natural color of the wood and use the oil. We're now applying the oil to the back of the tabletop. The oil is just the first step in the finish for the tabletop. We'll be putting on a polyurethane after this oil dries. So for now, I just need to apply one heavy coat of this oil to both sides of the surface and allow that to dry. One coat will be sufficient to bring out the natural color of the wood, which is what we're really going for. And by only using one coat, it'll also dry faster. So that's why we're doing one coat of oil. And after that, we'll move on to the polyurethane step. This oil is such a fun process. It gives us our first glimpse at how the table will look. And what we're seeing is just a lot of beautiful color come out. This wood has so much character. Each piece looks completely different than the others, but they all go together. It's really beautiful. There's so much interest in this piece. We love it. And these bow ties really look nice in here too. It's really been a challenge working with this old warped and cracked wood. There's been a few times during the project where I wondered if it was going to turn out. It was behaving really strangely, kind of warping and moving, and it was a real challenge to stabilize the piece and to fill all the cracks, but the end result is absolutely gorgeous, and I'm really glad we used this wood. It's full of character and beauty. I allowed the oil a couple of days to cure, and then we brought the piece into the workshop. We'll be applying polyurethane in this next step, and we need a fairly dust-free environment. That's why we brought it inside. I wiped the top down with mineral spirits just to remove all of the dust from sitting outside for a couple of days, make sure it's perfectly clean, and then I allowed a little bit of time for the mineral spirits to evaporate. And now I'm getting ready to apply the polyurethane. Polyurethane has a lot of advantages. It's incredibly tough and durable and therefore perfect for a kitchen table top, but it's also difficult to apply. So it's not a beginner product. Beginners can use it, but it's, it is more difficult than other types of finishes. It goes on rather thick and is fairly unforgiving. It does show some brush strokes, although a few of those will even out as it starts to dry. It also has a strong tendency to drip, and so it's best used on a horizontal surface like this where you don't have to fight gravity too much. The edges is something that you have to be really careful of. And as you can see, I'm wiping the edges down. Um, I'll do the edges last once I do the top of the table. Polyurethane also dries relatively slowly. It takes three to four hours for it to dry. And so in that time, if a bug lands on it, that bug is going to get stuck there and it's going to ruin your finish and you'll have to remove it before you can apply another layer. Um, also little nibs of dust get stuck in the finish if there's any activity going on and so it's just a little bit more difficult to apply. I dread applying it. I, I don't like using it but I like the result that it gives. Well it's about nine o'clock in the morning and I'm getting ready to flip this tabletop over and put on the final finishing coat on the top surface of the table. Unfortunately, we had a very cold night last night. It was the coldest night of the year so far. It got down to 14 degrees. And even at nine o'clock, it's still about 35 degrees in this shipping container. And that's way too cold to apply a finish to this table. I just took a temperature reading on the surface of the table and it's about 35 degrees. So I need to get it up to at least 45 or 50 degrees before I put some finish on it. And so we decided to bring in some heaters. So I have an electric heater going on the other side of the table, and I just now brought in a little propane powered heater. I do have good ventilation going in here, so that's not a concern, but I've just got to get some heat into the shipping container to get my tabletop temperature up so I can apply the finish. And then it'll be a race to get on all the coats that I need before it gets down way below freezing again tonight. For the top coat, I'm using a gloss polyurethane cut with a little bit of citrus solvent. I'll use gloss for all of the coats except for the final coat in order to preserve as much of the color and character of the wood as I possibly can. And then for the final coat, I'll use a satin so that I get the right sheen. Once everything was ready, we flipped the tabletop over to have the top side up. And then I cleaned off the surface with some mineral spirits before I applied the polyurethane.
And I'm getting ready to apply the first coat here. I'm hoping to get five coats on today. Uh, it'll be a race. I'm not sure if I can make it or not. I will settle with four. Four is definitely plenty. Five is kind of over the top. But I'd like to get five on if I can. The reason this is going to be such a race is I need to wait three to four hours between each coat and I need to put the final coat on before I go to bed at night because if I wait until in the morning it will have cured too much and the next layer may not bond so it all has to be done before I go to bed tonight. Since I got a late start this morning the amount of coats that I'm able to apply today will be determined by the dry time. It's 9.30, Red is putting the final coat on the table. He's been trying to get all of the coats on today. Chilly night, 34 degrees. We'll go check it out. Well, it's late and cold and I'm putting on the final coat. I'm using a satin for this, so this will be our finished sheen. So not too shiny, but I think all the color and character is still coming through, so I'm really happy with it. I was able to get four coats total. We're ready to assemble the base, so we're bringing over the pieces and getting ready to assemble it in the kitchen. We're moving this folding table out of the way. It's served us as our kitchen table in the meantime, and we're getting things cleaned up and ready. Here I'm putting together those diagonal cross braces. I tried my best to drill all of these holes through the brackets in these diagonal cross pieces uniformly so that maybe they would be interchangeable, but I just wasn't able to get it right. They still all only fit on the one end, so I have to keep track of which end they go on. And that's definitely been a challenge since I've had to put all of these metal pieces through some processing, you know, with the vinegar bath and everything, so I've been trying to keep them all separate and identified in some way so I know which ones go to which piece. And so far as I'm assembling these, it looks like I've kept them sorted properly. They all seem to be going on okay. One additional step that I've done to all these metal pieces, the bolts and the brackets, is to apply a coat of wax to them. I had applied some oil to them. I didn't feel like that was quite enough protection against rust and corrosion. So in addition to that, I went on with the wax. So I wiped everything down to remove any excess oil and then applied a microcrystalline wax. The brand is Renaissance Wax to all the pieces, and that should give them the best protection that I can give them without changing the appearance of the metal. And now for the final assembly. I just stand up these end pieces here, kind of getting everything laid out now. I've got these end pieces standing up, trying to <laughs> be careful not to bump them and make them fall over, and then put on that cross piece. Those dovetails just slide down into place, and I bolt them in. And now to assemble the diagonal cross pieces, here I'm assembling the hinge piece that I had fabricated. I've had this mocked up and pretty much in place, but I've never had all of the bolts in, everything, and so I'm hoping it all lines up. This will be the test for sure. So I'm bolting it to the pendulum brace up top, and then I'll be putting in the lag bolts to attach the hinge brace down at the bottom of the leg. Those lag bolts went in fine, and I'm ready to move on to the other brace. Unfortunately, I needed a little bit more clearance in one of the bolt holes for the attachment to the pendulum, so I did a quick walk back to the shop and drilled out that hole about a sixteenth of an inch larger to give me a little extra room. These brace pieces fit into the recess that I created with the router and chisels, and so once these braces are attached they sit flush with the outside of the wood. That'll allow the braces for the other diagonal piece to fit over the outside and be sitting on the surface of the wood so they won't stick out. And now I'm getting ready to attach the other diagonal brace. I'm just slipping the top set of braces up over the other set of braces on the pendulum. Makes a nice crisscross pattern up there. Then I'll be attaching that hinge joint at the bottom. In general, this base follows a fairly standard design for this type of table, but this pendulum brace here with this crisscross Diagonal braces was my own invention. I haven't seen another table like this, and so I felt good about this. I love the design. I also love the metal edition. I think that's something different as well. I love the look of it. It just adds a lot of character and interest. And now I'm just tightening everything up, making sure everything is good and snug, and this thing turned out really solid. It doesn't wiggle at all. It is, it is rock solid.
And now we're ready to add the tabletop, but it's over in the shop and it's an extremely heavy tabletop. It's really more than April and I can carry for very far. And so we backed up the car and set one end of it in the trunk of the car. And now April's driving the car forward and I'm walking along behind it, carrying the back. We have had our son or son-in-law help a few times, but it was late at night and we didn't want to bother them. And here's April and I muscling it into place that last little bit from the car to the house. And it looks beautiful. Now we just need to attach it to the base. I've already pre-drilled four holes through the base that I'll bring a screw up through there and attach the top to the base with four screws. I've carefully positioned the top on the base and now I'm transferring those holes into the top. I need to pre-drill those holes into the top surface of the table so that I can get those screws in there without the screws breaking. This wood is extremely hard. So we just got it in place, we transferred the holes, then we moved the tabletop over a little bit so I could access the holes better. And here I am drilling those holes out, pre-drilling for those screws, and then we'll move the table back into place and I'll insert the screws. I will mention that I left plenty of clearance around the hole in the base that the screw grows through so that as the tabletop expands, there'll be clearance and room for that screw to move over from side to side and lengthwise a little bit. It's really important to allow for tabletop expansion when you attach it to the base so that as it moves with the different temperatures and humidity levels, it doesn't get in a bind. Now I'm just doing one last check to make sure the top is in exactly the right place before I put in the screws. And now I'm just putting the screws in. I'm just getting them snug. I don't want them to be tied. I want them to be able to move. The screws have a broad washer type head and then there's another washer on that so that it has lots of room to move. This slick waxed concrete floor made it easy to just slide along to make these attachments. It was easier than crawling. And the table is finally complete. This has been a really fun project. It's been really satisfying. We love the look of the table. Uh, we find it to be very attractive. The wood is just gorgeous and it goes really well in the home. It's fun to make this table custom fit to our house. It's just the right size and design to fit our kitchen and dining area. And it was amazing to use all this reclaimed lumber that we had also used on the barn and on the well house and in other parts of the house. And so it really feels like it's bringing the whole place together in the home. So it has a lot of special meaning to us. We really love the table. Working with this reclaimed wood has been extremely satisfying. So glad we did. It has so much beauty and character, but it did take a lot more time and was much more difficult than using, you know, store-bought, nice, clean, fresh wood. But this was satisfying in a way that store-bought wood just would not have been. This was also, of course, extremely inexpensive. Our total cost on the wood is only $12.50. And then by the time you add all the hardware and finishings, we're still less than $150 for this table. And here we're putting together some barstools that we ordered. Um, these are a little smaller than we were expecting, so they won't be the main chairs for the table. These will be some kind of backup and extra chairs. We'll be looking for something that's larger and more comfortable for our primary chairs. And we found some. After considerable looking, we found some larger chairs that we think will be really nice. They've come in and now I'm starting to put those together. These new larger chairs were about $80 each and these smaller bar stools that we had earlier were about $50 each. These chairs were easy to assemble. They went together real quick. And what's nice about them is that they have a broad range of adjustments. So they'll fit these taller tables. So our kitchen is officially done. We have the table in place. We just got our chairs in yesterday. Red got them put together this morning. So those are looking great. We have six of these and then we have four bar stools. We originally thought that these bar stools would be great. But they're a little on the small side and not the most comfortable, so we did some more searching and we found these, which are looking nice. The kitchen is officially finished. 
I really like how everything turned out. So it's eight feet long. We'll easily be able to fit 10 chairs around it. Lots of extra space here. We did it narrow so that we can just use the countertops to put the food on and then it won't take up so much space here in the kitchen. So kind of a buffet style. So it all really came together. Love this table. Love the character of the wood. So in the next video, we'll do an update on our passive design and how it's performing this winter. It's a very comfortable house, so we'll tell you more about that in next week's video. And soon we'll be doing the shower, finishing up the master bathroom. So thanks for watching and join us again next week.